Good evening. My name is Jay Rothman, and welcome to Spirituality Gone Wild. Tonight, I have a special guest on. His name is Dr. Q. His real name is Dr. Q Collins, and I'm excited to have Dr. Q on. This is a special for, we'll call it health and wellness. And before we jump into the show and uh, really get into what Dr. Q is all about, I just wanted to give a brief update on myself. I just completed day 18 of my long-term water fast. At 5.30 p.m., I started day 19. And uh, it's been quite the experience. I have uh, worked really hard to pay attention to my body, uh, listen to uh, what my body is telling me, and uh, adjust uh, my days and adjust my protocol as, uh, as, un as different things have unfolded. And it's been, um, it's just been a beautiful experience. I, I'm noticing so, well, some, I'll say some subtle changes within myself that I am aware of. It's, it's really more on a functionality and on the exterior that I can see. I'm not really sure yet what's going on deep on the inside of my body. However, there are signs, there are signposts uh, that are pointing to some significant healing going on. And so uh, I'm really excited to have Dr. Q on. I was, uh, I was actually introduced to Dr. Q through a guest of mine that I had on a show last week and Melanie Proctor, who is the owner of uh, Fucat Cleanse out of Thailand. And she raved about Dr. Q and said, you've got you've to talk to him. You've got you to gotta see his YouTube videos, the conferences that he's done. And so what I'd like to do, uh, here we are. I put the invite out and Dr. Q said, yeah, um, I'm happy to come on your show and, and spread some of the knowledge and understanding that I have as far as how we can heal and how we can be healthier, healthier, uh, in our, uh, healthier in our, within ourselves. And so I'd like you to just share a little bit about yourself, what your background is um, and what it is exactly that you're doing today as well as share some of your own personal journey as a student of yourself. So without further ado, Dr. Q, it's all on you. Hey, thanks, Jay. It's great. Thank you for inviting me. This should be fun. Again, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Q, Dr. T. Q. Collins. I'm a PhD in clinical immunology. Got that 30-something years ago. Also, I have a master's in cancer epidemiology and oncotherapeutics, which is the study of making drugs. I've, I've probably done the gambit, uh, starting uh, with you know, work on the, gen, uh, the, the, the gene, the human genome project. I've made uh, uh, have patents in antibodies and, ke and chemotherapeutic drugs and antibiotics. So I've been around a long time and doing a lot of science. Um, over the last five to seven years, I've been one of the people in the background really developing the ketogenic diet, especially for people with uh, glioblastoma, which is a very virulent form of cancer of the brain, uh, which is incurable. I uh, came to that naturally because someone in, close to me developed a glioblastoma. Uh, I've also worked with uh, blood cancers, a variety of cancers over this year, but you name it. I've, I've worked on projects related to that or directly on them. Uh, as I said, about seven years ago, I started working with the ketogenic diet. And a lot of the things that people know about the ketogenic diet really came out of either work in my lab or, or work that I was doing with other labs, uh, including developing what is called the Keto Pet Sanctuary that was in Austin, Texas. And they're uh, funded by Quest Nutrition, the people that uh, make the Quest uh, bars. They funded my research there. We built a a 52-acre ranch in Austin, Texas, where we treated dogs with natural occurring cancers using ketogenic diets, deterrent depleted water, uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and all these other things that, uh, like IV vitamin C, all these other therapies that ultimately I wanted to use for people uh, to see to prove that a metabolic therapy would work uh, just as good as standard of care. And if not just as good, would make standard of care work better. Uh, and we did about seven different trials with different hospitals across the country. The last one being about two years ago with Cedar Sinai, 
and they were soft clinical trials. What I mean by soft clinical trials is that uh, we did them with the hospital and we did not put, uh, the, we didn't try to make things double blind because the truth is you're gonna die from this cancer. And the proof of principle in that it worked was that you didn't die. And we were very, very successful. Uh, first of all, with the dogs and over a hundred dogs, none of the dogs died of cancer. They may have died from the cancer <laughs> being killed too quickly. And we had to learn a lot of things about that. And with the people, we saw people extending their life expectancy uh, that they were given five months to 14 months who are actually still with us today. And so we're very, very proud of that. And so Jay, that's a little bit about me, where I'm from. And, you know, we can jump off into all the stuff that we're discovering since then. So um, I'm going to I'm going to jump right into this question for you. I've got a, a very close friend of mine. His name is Simon Gonzalez. He actually was on my show twice. And he, right now he's battling. Uh, he's got a, a prostate cancer that's metastasized to his bones. He's been battling this for three years using traditional Western medicine treatments. And at some point, his PSA numbers dropped to around the threes. And he's back up to last, I believe, was about 847. Mm -hmm. So he's heading in the wrong direction. And the doctors are scrambling now to uh, trying a different treatment on him, a new treatment, some type of taking the blood out, infusion, and then putting it back in. Mm -hmm. um, and he's been on a ketogenic diet. Um, through the majority of his of his three year battle, and yet his his numbers uh, his indications are that he's going in the wrong direction. Okay. Um, why do you think? And I know this is probably setting you up with this question, but why do you think uh, it works for some and it may not work for others? And I yeah, suspect yeah. they know what your answer is going to be. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny, funny to just. We actually, we actually published a paper in the Journal of Oncology last year about this very question, and it was titled To Eat and What Not to Eat. Uh, the, the problem with people talking about ketogenic diets, and they really, including myself, when as being one of the founders or, or forefathers of this type of therapeutic eating, we didn't really have an understanding of really what keto meant. It does not simply mean eat, eating a lot of fat. And that was the problem. So a lot of times when people talk about ketogenic diets, they're not designed properly. And what I mean by that is not the ratio of proteins and carbs and all the crap that we tell people. It's really what it's made from and where the constituents, the ingredients are from. What I learned from one of the other founders, uh, Dr. Laszlo Boros, is a full professor at UCLA and our principal scientist here, excuse me, our, our chief scientist here, he was able to show to show me biochemically how ketogenic diet works and it works really really simply because if an animal eats grass grass is the term depleted and i'll talk about the term in a minute and so when an animal eats grass just like we are what we eat the animal is what it eats so if it eats the term depleted it's meat and fat and milk and all these byproducts are deuterium depleted and healthy for you. The lower the deuterium depletion, the lower that the deuterium is in their body, just like the Lord is in our body, the healthier or the more therapeutic that food from that animal will be. So your friend, my guess is there are two things that go on with patients. One, is, as I said, their diet isn't their, it's really a deuterium depleted diet, a deuterium depleted ketogenic diet, which is what they should be eating. And the other problem, which is just amazing, is that people don't under, including doctors, they don't understand it's not enough to eat the food, your body must use, use it. So when we're so obsessed with looking at what our glucose numbers are, what our ketone numbers are, we're on a ketogenic diet, that only tells us how much is in the pipe, how much ketones and fat we're burning, or excuse me, making. It doesn't tell us how much we're actually using. And so that's really a big failure. And that's, a, that's one of the big things that we also created, all the diagnostics. And one of those diagnostics that, we've, that we utilize 
is looking at the oxygen and carbon dioxide that come out of your breath when you're eating. And that allows us to tell you if your body's actually burning fat or not burning fat. I don't care what kind of diet you're on. Or, and that is including fasting because the body is a very stubborn, stubborn animal. Uh, and it's going to do what it needs to do for itself until you induce it to do something else. And so that's my guess. Your friend never was in in, in, in ketosis per se, he wasn't using the ketones and fat that he was making. Instead, he was most likely using proteins, breaking down proteins in his body. Um, uh, you could probably, you know, from weight loss, and you can see some other things and burning muscle and turn that muscle back into glucose and still using glucose and not fats. Are you all getting that? Are you all getting what Dr. Q is putting down here? I want to just take a moment here to welcome uh, the audience that, that showed up tonight that is here live. I, I really appreciate you showing up tonight and participating in this live broadcast with Dr. Q and myself. Uh, thank you for joining us. If you're not here live and you pick it up on a replay, uh, welcome as well. I'm so appreciative that you are here tonight. If you hear something that resonates with you, hit like, hit love. If you have comments or questions, Dr. Q and I will do our best to uh, reserve a little bit of time to pick up some questions that you may have. Um, so uh, here we are. We are about 12 minutes into the show. Uh, you mentioned the word deuterium. Uh, could you do me a big favor? Since, you know, I had never heard of what deuterium depletion is until I met you last week. And what blows me away is that I have been, I've had numerous tests, extensive tests that go beyond the typical traditional blood work tests. I'm under the care of a medical team at Aceta Sinai, but I also um, have a relationship with a homeopathic doctor out of Santa Ana, Jeremy Caslow. And I am not aware that I have ever had my deuterium levels <laughs> measured or monitored in my body. And here I am with some, having had some significant medical conditions. What is deuterium? Why does it matter? And why are doctors not looking at that as a measurement uh, within whether or not we're healthy or not, or if it's an issue that we need to address that could either prevent or potentially reverse medical conditions? Okay. Those are great questions, and I thank you, thank you for asking them. Uh, first, I'm, go I'm going to try to really make this very, very simple, um, and we laugh about it. Uh, it's been 30 years doing this, and now we, we're overnight successes after 30 years, and we can. I, and I'm going to make it very simple so people can understand. However, if you, it would behoove anyone who's listening to go to our website, uh, which is DD Centers double D center, C-E-N-T-E-R-S dot com, because there's a wealth of information there. It's not because it's to sell you something, but there's a, a wealth of, we have, we've published over a hundred papers. We've treated over 8,000 cancer patients alone. Uh, we have professional athletes that we have under, uh, under our tent, uh, including gold medalists who we won four gold medals in the Winter Olympics, people that are our clients. Uh, we have a number of celebrities because it is, it is a fascinating how, uh, uh, how this is very important and the people that are in the know are in the know and the people that are not in the know have no clue about what this stuff is. And it's really important that people understand that when we started this, when we opened our clinic, three, almost four years ago, we opened the first clinic in the world to look at this from a clinical aspect under, again, under the umbrella of UCLA and LA Biomed, which is part of UCLA. When we did this, it hadn't been done before. Now, the deuterium is very simple. Everybody knows what hydrogen is. Hydrogen, the little, the H's that flow around in water, right? You get hydrogen, two hydrogens plus an oxygen gives you water. Everybody knows that. And it's important because 60 to 66% of your whole body is hydrogens. It's every place. Hydrogens, again, 
make up the earth. It makes up the it makes up the stars. It makes up Mars. It makes up everything. And when we think of the Big Bang, right? That boom, that pop. And then we got the universe. That pop was hydrogen and its cousin, deuterium splitting. Deuterium is simply <clears throat> the fat cousin of hydrogen, is what I like to call it. It's called the, the geeky word is called isotope, which means they're, they're, they're exactly the same element. They're both hydrogens, but the deuterium has an extra neutron on it. And because it's so small, that extra neutron gives it the weight and size. So now it's twice as big as its cousin. So just think about a softball versus a, 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 a I would say, a, a, I would want to say a baseball, but something even a, a, a pool ball, the size of that. But that not only is it twice that size, like a, like a softball, but it weighs the same as a shot put. It's heavy. And inside your, and what your body does is pretty amazing. Uh, and the things I'm gonna tell you, these are, these are biochemical laws. These aren't supposition. This is not uh, made up stuff. This is biochemistry. It's basically, this is the way life works. So I'm not trying to sell you a bill, bill of goods. I'm just teaching you a lot of things about biochemistry that you may not know. So you, when you eat your food, your body digests it. We all know that we get all of our energy and all of our body parts from the food we eat. What we don't know, what we, most of us don't know is that all your body does, it breaks that sandwich or it breaks that piece of meat up and it takes the hydrogens out of that bean, just the hydrogens. And it takes those hydrogens in your cytoplasm and it puts it into your mitochondria. And we all know about the mitochondria, right? That's that powerhouse of your cell. That's where all your energy is made. Uh, and, all, uh, and when you have a metabolic dysfunction, like fatigue or cancer or diabetes and heart disease. These are all called metabolic diseases because your mitochondria are screwed up. You can't make energy. Well, what screws them up is these hydrogens and go, are put into your mitochondria and inside your mitochondria, there are thousands and thousands of engines. Just, just imagine that just like stars in the sky, those are all engines inside one mitochondria. And they turn like fast turbine engines, about 9,000 revolutions per minute. So that's fast in a Corvette or Ferrari or, Mer or, Mer or a Mercedes or a Maserati, really high, like a jet engine, so fast. And they're turned by these flow of hydrogens that are going into them. So just like a wheel, just like a water wheel, it's turn, 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 turn by hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. When it hit the trium, hits that little motor, it breaks it because it's twice as big, twice as heavy. So just like if you're driving a Corvette 200 miles an hour and somebody put a large stone on your front tire, you're going to crash. It's not, it's, it's not magic, that's just what's gonna happen. Well, these deuterium crash your mitochondria. Your mitochondria no longer can make energy. Uh, we'll talk about some other things it make, it, it also makes. So it can't make energy by not making energy. Now you get tired, fatigue. Now you get fat, a ah, little obesity, then diabetes. Now your immune system doesn't work, cancer. So these, all of these things come from the same well. They all spring out and it's just a matter of what disease you're going to get from that metabolic disorder that you have, okay? So deuterium, just another big a fancy name for big hydrogen. It's naturally occurring, but it's rare. Only 155 hydrogens out of a million are deuterium. So it's very rare. And your body does everything. Your, what we're discovering is your body is set up to get rid of deuterium. That's the whole purpose of it. The reason you have cell membranes, the reason you have mitochondria is to get rid of all these things. But as we get older and sicker, our ability to deplete deuterium goes down. And so this is actually the thing that ages you. If, if the thing that people have, in, it's very interesting, the thing that is in common for people that live a long time, it's not their genes, it's, it's not their heart, it's not, it's their deuterium's alone. And so when you go to blue, uh, 
you know, you go to the, the, to the blue areas where people live longest, the deuterium's all lower. Uh, if you go to the, and deuterium is, since it's heavy, think about this. It's lower in the, at the height of, at the North Pole and the South Pole. It's lower at the top of mountains than it is in valleys. It's lower, um, it, it's, it's higher at the equator. Um, and it's lower as you get away from the ocean, right? As you get away from the oceans. So the amazing thing about that, I just gave you the patterns of health in the United States. Why are people healthier in Colorado, Utah, and um, uh, Colorado, Utah, and Nevada? Because they're at higher elevations, right? They're at higher elevations where the deuterium levels are lower. It's lower in their food. They walk around lower. They're able to exercise more because they have more energy. They're able to think better until they start smoking enough. That's another question. And today, if, because they're able, because the deuterium levels are lower. And so, so if, we don't live in, if we don't live in those high elevation states that you mentioned and others like Arizona, let's say, mm -hmm. how do we, how do we, uh, how do we lower our deuterium? Yeah. We live in, let's say, California, where we're yeah, very close a, to sea level. Yeah, so it's a really good. So it's really, you know, the, the, the truth is we screw it up ourselves, right? It's if so you can live in a place that has higher levels of deuterium, but you're supposed to eat in right. We already everybody's gonna know this, so I know it's gonna say no duh. So if you look at this, you should be eating from the place you live in. So if you were to eat local foods, those local foods would be balanced with the sunlight and everything and the pressures that is good for that to trim level where you are. But what do we do instead? We go to Ralph's and at Ralph's, we can go buy grapes from Chile every day in the week. We can buy apples from New York. We can buy, you know, luckily we grow all our own avocados, but we can grow all this food and eat all these foods and fish and animals from any place in the world that's what makes us makes it tough because our body is totally dysregulated because it no longer has all the way it's supposed to be. So how do we do it? We say it very, very simply. We're making people understand what the deuterium levels are, different foods and waters are. And what you have to do is real simple. Don't eat foods that are above 130 parts per million. That's it. <laughs> then your body can can help itself. Now, what you'll ask me, Jay, is which ones are they, <laughs> right? So, and that's where we come into So That's what we really do here is trying to discover all these different patterns. So we do know for a fact that grass-fed animals, the reason grass-fed animals, like I said, are better for you is because they eat grass and grass is deterior depleted. Therefore, those are going to be lower in deterior. Organic, why is organic food better for you? Not because it's organic per se, but because the pesticides they use on organic actually go to your mitochondria and kill something in your TCA cycle. It's going to kill something that makes metabolic water because what the, the whole thing is what nobody out there that's listening to this really understands very well is your body actually makes this deuterium depleted water itself from the food you eat. So your mitochondria and all that stuff you think about it only being to make energy, it's really the major function is it makes water from the food you eat. So every, think about this, every one pound of fat you eat, or every one liter or every thousand kilograms of fat you eat, your body makes 1.1 liters of water. So you sleeping all day long, your body without moving, your body's still going to make a liter of water. It makes during the day about anywhere from three to five gallons of water when you're active. You just never see it because it's utilized over and over and over again with your oxygen you breathe in, things like so. This is this is so it's really easy to do this. You just have to, it's it's you just have to really be aware of how your body works and how biochemistry works. Switching gears real quick. Uh, you you mentioned uh, the keto diet, uh, but there's you know that's one of the hot trends. But there's another one. Uh, a lot of people lean into uh, becoming vegan. So 
So let's talk a bit. So the, again, here's how this works. And vegans are, and, and becoming vegan is usually more than just an eating choice. It is a, 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 a choice that also is an ethical and philosophical thing. And I, I my, my more power to them. But when you look at what a, a green plant, if a, in this whole plant dies, out, the reason they work and they work so well is because for the most part, if you're their green, like broccoli and spinach and kale, these are going to be deteriorating depleted. That works. The failure comes about just like we talk about kill and everything else is when you start to eat the potato and a lot of the fruit, fruit that goes along with it because what the green plant does with the deuterium is it puts it in the seeds. It puts it in the things that are going to grow other fruit and other vegetables. Um, so if it's a therapeutically, we don't allow things like fruit and potatoes and these high deuterium foods or vegetables to be used while we're in a, a strictly therapeutic diet. Now, the lifestyle is different, but uh, but we shouldn't, at the same time, you should eat a lot of fruit. Doesn't, because again, think about what fruit's from. And I know we're in, especially if you're in California, you don't get it. But really the way fruit works is it usually grows during a very short period of time on a tree, it falls down from the tree if you don't eat it. And within 24 hours, bacteria eat it up and an animal picks it up, eats it, gets diarrhea and poops another tree. That's what fruit's for, right? It's not really what we've been, we've learned now to make it a staple of our diet and it's not supposed to be. So if I, if I hear you correctly, um, we eating uh, a lot of even let's say berries if if right now if someone's diet is the vegan they're doing whole plant-based organic and they're doing organic let's say fruit but limiting it to berries strawberries blueberries blackberries raspberries are you suggesting that we uh, eat less of the fruit and more of more of the, the, the green in a, in a vegan diet? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. And complex and the right things to get enough protein. That's the other important thing that, that's missing in most vegan diets is that most people don't understand how to pot complex uh, their proteins to get the proteins they need, enough proteins they need to build muscle and, and other replacement parts in their body. So, yes, now there is a caveat to everything I'm saying, and that is, this is really individualized medicine in that you could be able to be a good deuterium depleter. In other words, your sleep is great. Your uh, breathing is great. All these things that go into depleting deuterium that you could eat more fruit because your body's able to deplete it better. However, if you're therapeutically challenged or metabolically challenged, you're going to have to eat less fruit. You're going to have to be tighter until that deuterium level lowers itself. And when it lowers itself, your sleep will get better. Your breathing will get better because that's the way the body works. Now, we come in and we can speed that up because usually people don't have the seven or eight years it takes for your body to rebuild itself and repair all the damage that came from having high levels of deuterium. But yes, you're right, Jay. Uh, even as a vegetarian or a vegan, what's missing in their diets usually is not enough enough protein too much fruit too much too many tubers and potatoes and not enough plant oils fat is just as important in a vegan or vegetarian diet as it is in a in a carnivore's diet doesn't make a difference fat is everything now you mentioned fat and of course we we know there's healthy fat there's good fat and there's bad fat uh, are you advocating that all fat is good for you or? So, so, so here, here's the thing. There's, there's the only really bad fat. Uh, again, it, when we think about the things we talk about, and that's a perfect, a, a perfect opportunity to talk about this. We talk about things being bad or good for us and not the body really doesn't care. The body only wants the hydrogen. So let me just make sure everybody understands that. But because so many of us walk on this planet, uh, especially in, in, in countries like the United States, we 
we're injured, we're not healthy. Therefore, those things that we call bad fats, when we eat them, it hurts us. If you were healthy and normal, those things that we may call bad fats, they're not as bad. They just they won't hurt you. It's just it's just that we're walking around injured. But you're absolutely right to err on the on the side of 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 of, of being smart about it. Then eat the good fats, right? That's fine. Then eat the good what we think are we as what we call good fats. Um, you know, we know trans fit. Limit trans fats, no doubt about it. Try to get simple fats, no doubt about that. Hydrogenated oils, stay away from. Because again, hydrogenated oils, the way they're synthetic foods, the way they're made is they add deuterium onto oil to make it hydrogenated. So it's just a high deuterium food. Uh, so two, yes. Two questions that have come in. One from Mary Kelly says, sweet potatoes, are they good to eat? Are they? So, so they're, they're better so, in the way. Yeah. So no, again, all the stuff that we think about, you know, wheat and brown bread versus white bread, your yeah, body yeah, doesn't body. care. <laughs> it really doesn't. It can't tell the difference. So, is a potato, a sweet potato, better than a white potato? The answer is only if it's just what's the trim level of that potato. Where was it grown? That's really what your body's going to do. Now, if your deuterium levels are high and your energy's low, right? You're not having enough to burn the food you eat. That's when those things like a, where a tuber or a sweet potato or a yam is better than a white potato because it's just a matter of how long it takes to be digested. And so that's, that's starting to play with other things that have nothing to do with health, but have to do with, with being less sick. What do you what do you personally cook with as far as oil go? What's well, we use our, our for high temperatures. We use a we, we use a lot of avocado oil. Um, it's mostly avocado oil. We have we do use coconut um, coconut oils too, uh, but most of the time, you know, we do a lot of uh, um, a lot of quick flat frying and, and blanching, and we do a lot of a lot of stuff on the barbecue. So. Tell me what your perspective is on how important does exercise play in a role of deuterium, uh, de uh, lowering the de deuterium levels in our body? Yes, everything. So everybody's going to feel very, very incredibly smart because everything you know about good health is true. Exercise is important, but it's the right exercise that depletes deuterium, right? So the reason high intensity Think about what our ancestors did. They didn't go to the gym every day and work out, right? What they did is they ran five to six minutes, seven minutes to catch the food they were going to eat or to get rid of a tiger. So this, you want to work with aerobic exercise, highly aerobic exercise that is short. So high intensity training, fantastic. Those are the kind of things that condition your, meta, your metabolism, condition your mitochondria to make them stronger to make more energy, to get them in better shape. All those other things like long distance running and bicycling, that's in, that's a hobby, that's great. Do those things. Um, it's not so much for your metabolism, but it could make your muscles and back stronger, Your those kind of things. But for your metabolism, it doesn't deliver the bang for the buck that high intensity exercises. And then again, if you have cancer, it's a completely different thing. When you have cancer, we don't have them exercise like like a person that doesn't have cancer, because the breakdown, as you all know, as anybody's exercised, is you get that sore feeling from the lactic acid. Well, that lactic acid is a scavenger fuel for cancer cells. So we don't we you, people must know what they're doing, and so we don't have cancer patients exercise hard. It's not it's not good for them in the long run. Hmm. Wow. Are you all getting this? this Dr. Q is, he's just, he's just spewing out just so much information and knowledge. And you know, one of the reasons he, when we talked last week, he said he'd, he'd really be uh, thrilled to come on a show is because knowledge is power. And part of what his role is, is he likes to push the information out, the knowledge out, 
And his knowledge is based on, his experience is based on research studies and the work that, that he has done over the years. Um, I got one more question on, the, on, on this whole deuterium topic. And then I'd like to kind of fast forward or switch gears in the fasting. One thing is, the one question is, uh, being that I've been under the, I'd say a pretty strict regimen of doctor care for the past thir three years now. I am not aware that I've ever been tested. I've never had a conversation. I never heard of this deuterium mm. depletion until I met you. So mm. when I go to my doctor next month and do my blood runs, uh, if I ask him, I'd like to be tested to see what my deuterium levels are. Is he going to look at me like I've lost my mind during this 30 day fast or what's he, what's he going to say? <laughs> yeah. And that's the truth. He will look at you cross-eyed because what you don't know, you don't know. So indeed what we do a lot now, we teach at UCLA, we th we're teaching this to medical students now. It's a class for medical students. It's being taught at the University of Washington and at the University of Pittsburgh will start the class. So we're get, we're turning the corner uh, and we're writing a textbook right now. So we're turning the corner to make this part of the medical uh, uh, curriculum. So at least a new wave of doctors will understand how to utilize this because the important thing about this, it makes all standard of care work better. You can imagine if you've got more energy, you're going to be a better patient. You're going to be able to recover faster. You're, you're going to get your wounds are going to heal faster. You're going to think better. So this is very important, a basic platform for all doctors and for functional medicine. This is the first test you should know. So what do we do now? We've developed the biggest thing. The biggest thing that we've done is we we're talking about before, Jay, is one of the ways we've improved this whole science is we've been over the last four years being able to develop clinical assays that would allow people to measure the deuterium inside their body. Uh, and validated to where it's so tight and so precise that even the FDA and the NIH are using our assays to do the same thing. So we have a uh, the test to that measures the deuterium in your breath, and that is a measure of how much deuterium is in your tissues and muscles. Now it's just a marker. It could be different places, in, in, but it's a, a general marker. And in your saliva or urine, that's your biological fluid. So that's your tears, your saliva, the inside of your cytoplasm, it's a measure for what's in your biological fluids. Then we can go the next step and we can take an MRI and we can, just like you take in a regular MRI, we can do the same thing. And with that MRI, tell where all the deuterium clouds are in your entire body. So we can say, oh, the reason that this muscle is pulling all the time is because you have a lot of deuterium in that muscle. And so maybe we'll do lymphatic, dra lymphatic drainage or something like that to remove it. And you'll see that muscle being able to work better. Or we'll see, oh my goodness, there's three or four very bright spots there. Those are metastases that your other MRI and other things can't see. So we need to address, to have your doctor address metastases because you have them and he just can't see them yet. So, and then we can look at cholesterol. We can look at the term in cholesterol and DNA. So we made all these tests to make this a fundamental and easy tool for any clinician to use. And we're now doing, I guess we've probably done about 3,000 of these over the last couple of years since we've done it. Uh, we're getting better and better at it. Uh, and we've taken the price of these things down. When we started, it was almost $3,000 to do a test. And now, um, you can do a test for $375. And I really believe, and I tell people this all the time, and our professional athletes to tell you the same thing, it's more important to know your deuterium levels than it is to know your glucose levels or your weight or all these other things because your deuterium levels determine all those other things that you see. It determines your blood count. It determines your heart rate. It determines everything. So know your deuterium levels first, and then from there, lower your deuterium, see what effects it has, and then go out to rebuild the problems that age brings of, of, of not being able to deplete as well as you should be able to. So if if I go to my doctor and ask him for part of my blood work at the lab, lab corp to, to, to test my deuterium level, are they capable of testing it or is this a very specialized what, what you would do is just you would go to our site and just 
get the deuterium test off the site and we mail it to you. We just mail it to you, you do it, you mail it back to us, and we get the, the results back within two or three weeks, you have those results. Uh, and then from there, we usually put people, get them stored on a protocol right out of the box. And then when the deuterium levels come back, we can adjust that protocol to match whatever their goals are. But yeah, so we have doctors so ordering. Do you, you work with patients nationwide? Because, I mean, how many guys, how many, how many, how many practitioners or research centers like yourself are out there? Um, right. Yeah, right now we have about 200 doctors in our network that are using what we do. Uh, we're gonna and we're actively getting the ones we want because it's really about getting the research back. Because what we're really this is we're not in it for the money. We're in it for the research, and we want to make sure that as we move forward, that we get answers for your audience. For instance, so when we say something, they know it's the gospel and it's not bullshit. It's not about selling the next capsule or the next this or that we don't care if if tomorrow there's something that makes it better we'll tell you about that something we don't care where it comes from but you'll know it comes from one of the best universities in the country from three or four of the top scientists in the country and that's who we are so again we've everything we do is published in top journals not secondary journals the top 25 journals in the world and not only do we do this for people in the United States, Jay. But we also have, you know, we have clients in China, uh, Thailand, Sweden, uh, the Netherlands, England. So this, we do this all over the world now. Do you have any statistics that you could share with us tonight as far as what your success rate is or has been as far as healing uh, major chronic diseases? You've mentioned cancer, diabetes, autoimmune. Uh, have, do you have any statistics to share? Yeah, I can talk about that. We we always, uh, uh, Laszlo Boros, again, as our chief scientist, we always make the joke that we're fantastic scientists, but we have the worst business model in the world because we tell people, get your deuterium levels below 130 and we don't have to see you again. So it's about that, it's really that simple. So when it comes to, to can, our, our, we're, there is not any case, and we never had a cancer patient that we're not successful with. What we can get is a cancer patient who comes to us too late and there's so much damage that they can't recover from the damage that's there, right? But as far as being able to slow the growth of a, as far as return the person's metabolism, and again, think about what I'm saying. I wanna make sure people understand this. Our job is to fix your metabolism. If we fix your metabolism, metabolic disorders don't have anything, there's no disorder anymore. There's nothing for them to use. So as we fix your metabolism, the question is how much damage has that metabolic dysfunction done to your body? So it may be that you've had diabetes for five years, so your body's gonna get the energy. The diabetes is no longer diagnosed. However, there may be some things we're gonna to have to fix to reverse the damage that it did, maybe to your kidney flows, maybe to your cognition, uh, maybe to your weight, right? Those are things that come after. Um, and it's the same thing with like your friend with prostate cancer. We have, we actually have crazy stories to where my favorite one is a, is a, a person that's, He's 72 years old, he's from Hungary, and he is a, just a working stiff, a working guy. Stage four cancer, they put him out the pasture, he came to see us, uh, his process, the cancer went away, he goes back to the doctor, and they said, that's really good, now we can put you on standard of care to make sure it's not there anymore. He told him to go to where the sun don't shine, he walked out of there with Laszlo, and 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 he went back to work at 72. He's working again. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's a great story, but at least it, that's for him. He, he likes it. So yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it, it, it works it, in all things. It, it works 100% of the time if you do what you're supposed to do because it's just science. It's You think about it. It's just that if you put the right gas in a gas tank, it's the engine's going to run better. That's all we're saying. Thank you for that. 
Uh, I'm going to ask a, a question I'm going to share from Melanie Proctor. Uh, she says, when people long-term fast and have dangerously low blood sugar levels, is that relevant? And, or is one burning fat at that point and blood sugar levels are not relevant? What up, Melanie? Hello. Did I lose you, Doc? Are you there? Yes. Okay, you froze for a sec. All right, let me make sure. Can you hear me? Time out. Okay, so, so you're when you're in ketosis and you're burning fat, and when we talked about and utilizing fat, you don't need glucose. Glucose is not necessary, and I've it's just something that we've we've gotten an understanding. It's gotten to our lexicon as being important because we just high carb diets now. That's not probably the way our body was made. We ate a lot of fat and a lot of meat. So ketones were more important or just as important. And I'll give you a perfect example. We work with the Mars Project and um, we have, we saw, uh, if not my group, but another group, we're working with the astronauts uh, that are going to Mars and they're all on really strict keto, deuterium depleted diets. And their blood glucose is in the 30s. And trust me, they're still super men, you know, and super women. They can do anything, they can run for hours, they can pass any tests, any cognition tests. Glucose is not important when your body is burning fat. And that leads me to the last uh, portion of the show um, as we're rounding out the hour. I'd like to spend some time uh, speaking a little bit about long-term fasting. Last week, Melanie was on. She does intermittent fasting and she does short-term fasting. Uh, I was intrigued to, to talk to you about long-term fasting because what you share with me is that you are your own student. <laughs> you use your own data for part of your research. So can you share a little bit about your personal story about fasting, uh, the duration of fast you've done, and how fasting can help your body? What's okay. the benefits of fasting long-term? All right, so let's talk about that. So I, I am, uh, I'm a keto person. I intermittent fast all the time. Um, uh, the first time I really fasted long term was for a 30 day fast. But even during that time, it was I really didn't want to eat. So it was, yeah, it was, it was more an opportunity to fast. But the last fast I did was this year, uh, and it was 70 days. And that's 70 days in a row, water only fast. As I told Jay. Uh, I did have five uh, uh, broccoli, five pieces of, of, of broccoli sprouts um, for um, Brussels sprouts, excuse me, Brussels sprouts for Christmas at a Christmas dinner. Uh, but that's it. And was that reason, intentional? Wait a minute, was that intentional or were you cheating? <laughs> I, you know, I, I felt bad, you know, because I, when somebody bring, gets you to the house for dinner, it's, you know, I always get that, what do you mean you're not eating? <laughs> so so I ate, okay, that, that's it. They were happy, I was happy. Peer pressure. <laughs> Yeah, peer pressure. That's about it. Uh, so, but 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 over that seventy days, I did it. I, I started out. It was only going to be a two-week fast, and one of the people that I, um, Raymond Edmonds of OKL Group on Facebook, he's one of my, you know, he's a fantastic person, and one of the people I is one of my go-to for fasting, and it's going to become part of the group because fasting and deuterium depletion are totally related. But to make a long story short. Two weeks turned into three weeks. Three weeks turned into four weeks. Four weeks turned into seven, you know, 70 days. And so, and I stopped it because I simply wanted to. I could have kept going. Um, and I wanted to do this because so often I want to, when I ask a patient to do A, B, and C, I want to make sure that I've done it. So I can look them in the eye and say, it's going to hurt or it's how long it's going to hurt and what you're going to get out of it. What do you get out of a, of a two week fast or, or any, I always say one week or more is necessary. You get a new, a new immune system. Uh, you start to see your skin cells turn over. If you sleep on, you're going to sleep better. Uh, and, and it's even more, you're even going to have better cognition. Again, over that 70 days, I did not stop working. I probably still gave three or four seminars and classes. I traveled. I was never tired. 
Um, and if you are tired and when you're fasting, it's because there's a couple of things you're not doing correctly and we can adjust those things. Uh, but the bodies are also a beauty. Here's what I want people to also understand about fasting is that you can, when the body gets used to fasting, so if you fast once, it makes the second time easier. It makes the third time easier than the second time. And it keeps going like that. So that's, you know, you can work your way up. And I think what you're doing, Jay, is fantastic. And it does pay off. It's going to, it, fasting is the, the body's way of correcting metabolic disease. There is no doubt about it. It's not, it's not eating better. It's not eating, <laughs> it's not eating. You know, just like a dog, everybody's had dogs. They go under a tree, they don't eat, they stay in the sun. And when they're better, they get up and they start running. We just need to do more of that. How um, how long do you suggest between fa long-term fasting? So, you know, again, you should look at um, a minimum of two to four times your fast, between fast, between fast. So two to four times. So if you're, for me, if 70 days would mean that at a minimum, I should go another 140 days without fasting, at a maximum of 280 days, um, you know, but I always tell people too, it depends on how much extra refrigerators you're carrying on your body too. So, and you so, don't look like you're carrying a lot of refrigerators. Well, right now I'm not, I mean, when I started the fast, I already had lost 58 pounds uh, intentionally. So now I'm down another almost 15. Yes. So, and as of this morning, I was 126.7, I believe. Um, so if I continue along this trajectory, if I, if I stop at 30 days, that's an if. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's another 12 pounds. Uh, I don't know that I, unless my body levels out, I, I was hopeful that it would level out at the 130 mark, but it leveled out for a couple of days and now it's starting its decline. So mm -hmm. at this point, uh, if my numbers are right, I'll end up at about 114 pounds at the 30 day mark. And I, the last time I was outweighed, I was probably a, a you know, a, a young teenager. So I don't know, you know, from a health perspective, how low can I go without it, that becoming an issue for me? Well, here's, here's my suggestion. And this is for anybody who wants to fast. I want you to think about it a different way. So if you think about your body as a container, Within your body, the way you've eaten, the life you've lived, you have a certain amount of deterioration in it, right? And it's really in your body. Most of it's in your body fat because that's your body fat stores. Just like a, if a cow eats all grain, a cow's gonna have fat that's all grain. As a person eats a cow that's all grain or cereals and grains and fruits, that means our body fat has deterioration in it. That means our cholesterol has a tear in it. That means our testosterone and estrogen and bile and neurotransmitters all have this deterioration in it that make them less effective because it changes the three-dimensional structure. It just changes everything that's in your body. So really what you've done is you've given your body the opportunity to burn away and get rid of those ill-formed or malformed ingredients that make up UJ. So now my suggestion is not that you have to go long, you can break it now, but when you start eating again, what you're going to do is be very select on what goes in your mouth. So you're gonna eat all the churn depleted foods, all low range, you're gonna drink less bottled water because then you're going to rebuild a new J that is a J from 30 years ago that has the right muscle tone, that has the right brain cells, that has all of these healthy things associated with someone half your age, because that's where you will be. And if you keep it there, then what you've really done is you've extended your healthy life. So you could, you know, who knows, maybe you're gonna make it to 70 or 80 or 90, but now you'll make it to 120, 130 without being sick. See, everybody always talks about that. There's nothing glorious about living long if you're sick. That's dumb. But if you were to live a long life, 
and you simply die because your body wore out. That's what we're intended to do. And so that's my suggestion. Don't think about length. It's really rebuilding that process and, and feeding yourself the things that are now going to make health, healthy cholesterol. And now your cholesterol, instead of being fat soluble, is going to be water soluble because you're going to take sulfur with it. And believe it or not, vitamin D, cholesterol, they're all water soluble. They're not supposed to be fat. They're only fat soluble because our diet suck. That's all. So that's my suggestion and you'll get just as much out of it. And then when you fast again, then you can get rid of these up. But now you'll have more energy, right? Because your deuterium levels are going to be lower. You're going to have much more energy. A lot of the things and uh, the metabolic dysfunction that you have won't be there anymore. And so when you do it again, you can go for the next goal. And the next goal is that next metabolic dysfunction. Then you stop it. You rebuild it the right way. And you, you just set up by goals by goals. And within a year, if you set four or five goals, all of your metabolic dysfunction will be gone. That's what we teach our patients. And it's a much easier because everybody loves to see progress, right? Everybody does. And you can do that. So don't, you know, don't worry about, you, you don't have to do it balls to the wall. It's just not important. It's just be smart about it. New information to uh, to pause and process. You know, for me, real real quickly, I'm trying to, I'm not trying, I'm, my intention was to heal some significant, it's not just one, it's three or four uh, diagnoses and that have lingered. And uh, so for me, you know, a rare blood autoimmune, which has been the most uh, impactful in my life is a big one. Mm. And, and so from my understanding, People that, per se, let's say, have cancer, uh, they typically do 30 days uh, water fasting. So uh -huh. I look at my rare uh, blood disorder as a significant disease like a cancer. Uh, I look at, uh, I've got a, a, I had a nodule they diagnosed on my left lung um, back at the end of June that wasn't there in November. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm an ex-smoker. So uh, that those are just two. Of course, there's the, the heart disease and a few other um uh, I had diabetes, but I've reversed that. But mm -hmm. high blood pressure, I've still been on meds for that for nine years. So I'm I'm looking at it as I'm in it for the long haul because um my goal is to re, is to heal all of those diagnoses. And you're saying that's balls to the walls, and maybe I should just um, you know I don't have to do 30 or 40 right now. Is if I'm hearing you right, but just break it up and 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 see what progress I've made when I feel like I'm done enough now and do it if I, let's say I do 20 days. Uh, so that means in 40 days, I start the next fast? Yeah, you could, you could, you could. Yeah. I mean, it, but, and you gotta remember what's gonna happen is by having these lower deuterium levels and building right, now all your nanomotors are gonna be working better. So you're gonna be burning more calories. So by burning more calories, it's gonna gonna do the same thing that you want to for fast. So intermittent fasting becomes much, 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 much more effective than it is for you right now. Um, and so those are kind of little things that we look at. We look at resting metabolic rates of our patients. And so we see, just like in my case, my resting metabolic rate went up all the way through 70 days of a fast. I didn't lose anything. So it started very dysfunctional. And by the time I was finished, it was a 2700, where in most cases, as calories per day, at most cases, people would have thought my metabolic rate would have went down. But because it was this deuterium depletion protocol, that means my nanomotors were running better, my mitochondria were operating better, and therefore I was burning more, needed more calories. What do you think is the threshold, the minimum threshold for someone that is looking to let's say reverse or heal um, significant major chronic diseases. What's the, th the minimum threshold? So I think, you know, I, I, I like one and two week fasts, but even a, even a 40 hour, 72 hour fast is very effective on turning your immune cells on and causing autophagy of just, of just other cells that are around bad old cells. Um, 
even a lot of things as far as plaques and things in a heart. I mean, short-term fasting, a lot of times we'll work on that. But the important thing, and you, you, you're, you're catching it already, and I like that question to ask, at the end of the day, all you want to be able to do is make a better J. If you make a better J, then that better J can fight off those metabolic disorders better. And so just keep making J better. Uh, you don't have to do it all at once because that's not that's that's a very difficult thing to do when there's more than one disorder. And as far as autoimmunity, uh, being you know, I can tell you the way autoimmunity even works is because it takes a, a, a which can you which uh, disorder do you have? It's uh, called antiphospholipid disorder. It's a APS. It's a rare blood disorder that causes my antibodies to create more and causes blood clots. So yeah. major blood so clots throughout my, my arteries and, and vital organs. So here's, here's the way this works. So the same thing, phospho, phospholipids go through, the, go through your cellular membrane. You already know that. So it makes up your, your cellular membrane and that's what, what, but what has happened is with all your metabolic disorders, you probably have a phospholipid that actually is contaminated again with the deuterium. Now, if you think about this, think about Legos, right? And how you put pieces of Legos together. If you get another Lego that's twice as big, then that shape that you are going to make, that house is not gonna look like a house anymore. It's gonna look like a funny looking car, right? That's what's happened to your phospholipids. So that the, this ill-shaped phospholipid that's inside your cell now is different and your immune system says, hey, that's not normal. And it goes after it. By depleting your deuterium levels and, uh, and re, re, reintroducing the correct phospholipids into your, into your cellular membranes. And, and again, autophagy, fasting. So that means those cells that are irregular will be eaten up and go away. That's autophagy. Um, so by doing it this way, what you'll be able to do is lessen the body's immune system. There's nothing for it to respond to. So you want to take down the amount of phospholipids that are incorrect in your cells below that amount of which your immune system sees. And if you do that, and that's the best way to do that, like I said, is with these bursts of, of, of fasting and rebuilding yourself so your body has the ingredients or, or building blocks to make a better jet. Okay. All right. Well, Doc, we are, we are just about out of time. Uh, I, uh, I'd like to uh, ask you to perhaps just give us a, a closing summary. And also, again, I repeat how people can get hold of you. Uh, if they're interested in working with you and your team, what's the best way to get hold of you, reach out, and, uh, and I'm going to ask you to just perhaps give a, a closing summary of uh, your thoughts on uh, what this is all about. Okay. Well, you can get, again, our website is uh, double D, 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 centers, C E N T R S dot com, double D centers dot com. Uh, as is our Facebook and Double D Centers, our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts, uh, all the all the same things too. And then our 800 number is 1-800-208-0280. Again, 1-800-208-0280. So you can get us either way. Um, here's what I like to say. When, I, when, when in closing, it, life is really, really, really simple. Um, and, and, and after having two PhDs and going through all these degrees and working my entire life, it really comes down to something very simple. The more energy you have, the better your, that's what health is, the healthier you will be. So you wanna do everything to guard your body's ability to make energy, to guard your bo body's ability to use that energy. And that the easiest way to get through that is by eating the way you already know with a different twist, living the way you already know you're supposed to live with a different twist and being the person you want to be with a different twist. And as you said before, 
You know, knowledge is power. But I always say wisdom is the ability to use that knowledge the right way. So I, thanks, everybody. Beautiful. Uh, hey, Doc, I'm going to ask you to stay on. We're going to end the broadcast in a moment. I'd like to just do a, a wrap up with you offline. Um, however, I want to just thank uh, those that joined us live again. You hit us with a lot of questions. If you're able to go back on to, uh, I believe I tagged you on the show, so it's going to show up on your feed, Doc. If you could uh, perhaps maybe take some time just to answer some of the questions, because there's some probably good ones out there. People are searching. Uh, in the meantime, I want to just announce that my show, Real Men, Real Talk Raw, is going to be back on schedule uh, this Sunday at 1 o'clock. It's a rescheduled show from last Sunday that we had technical difficulties. Pro tennis player, retired Justin Bauer, is going to be live in the studio. He's going to be sharing his story. He played, uh, he played in the Australian Open. He was a professional tennis player at a young age, age 18. He was, he was striding, he was hitting, he was volleying, he was winning tournaments, and, uh, and then he had an injury. And that injury just changed the trajectory of his career, but it just put him in a different space that allowed him to really basically, really start to understand who he was because when he walked away from tennis, he had to figure out who he was because tennis was his whole life. To make it to a pro in any sport, your total focus, your total energy, your life is, a, is reaching for the highest peak performance. And so he's going to come on, he's going to share how he has reinvented himself a number of times as a, as a business person. He's completing his first book. It's called Going Crazy, or Going Mental. It's Going Mental. He is a mental coach today. He is uh, a man with tremendous wisdom and knowledge. He is born and raised in South Africa, but he is quite, quite the man, quite the inspiration. I'm excited to have him on the show. Uh, we're just going to keep switching it up. Every time we have a guest come on, they've got a different story of knowledge, of inspiration, of love, of kindness, whatever it may be, of pain. Uh, but we just keep we just keep showing up and putting our message out there in social media. And so with that, we're going to jump off, have a beautiful evening. And with the weekend coming up, I ask one thing of all of you. Just take some time to do some self-care, no matter what's going on in your life put down a to-do list and do something for yourself every single day. Make it a practice, make it a daily practice or ritual. And, and just by doing that alone, you'll start to see your, your life will shift, your life will get better. And with that, thank you. We'll see you Sunday, one o'clock. Thanks, Doc. Thank you. <laughs>